thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you especially to the organizers for allowing me to share some thoughts with you all. This has been uh, an, an amazing symposium, there are lots of interesting ideas. And in particular, we've heard a lot about the intersection of artificial intelligence and neuroscience. And so what I'd like to do is uh, talk about some ideas of, uh, that b borrowed from neuroscience and deployed outside the brain. And in particular, this idea that biology offers, if, if we want to use biology as, as an inspiration for AI, biology offers many, many uh, interesting contexts that are not brains. And so I'd like to sort of pull us away from uh, the neuroscience of the brain and, and think of some other things. And if anybody wants to reach me later, um, all of the primary data, the papers, the software, everything else is, is, is here. So um, many, many discussions still to this day uh, take place in the context of this very old idea that this is, of course, uh, Adam naming the animals in the Garden of Eden. This idea that, that there's a specific natural kind called the human brain, and it does various things, and uh, we would like to, um, of course, uh, you mine that for insights as to how we can create uh, intelligence. But one of the things that is, is really critical to note is that if we take developmental biology and evolution seriously, all of us uh, began life as single cells. And uh, whether on an on a evolutionary time scale or a developmental uh, time scale, there's a continuum here. And, these, pro and these, this, these transformations are very slow and continuous. Uh, of course, we can try to pick out what we call gray transitions and try to impose some sort of uh, phase, phase transition on these. But the underlying biology is very smooth and continuous. And then, of course, now we have this additional axis of manipulations we can make where, where we can step away from the standard human architecture and both with technological uh, hybrids and with, with biological modifications make any sort of combination that you want. And so uh, I, w w that the, in, in our lab, we think very, uh, very, very hard about these kinds of issues. Where does intelligence come from and how does it scale up through these kinds of uh, transformations? So the, the important thing about us is that we, and I, I think all intelligence is really our collective intelligences. So what you're seeing here, this is a single cell. This is what we're made of, uh, although this, of course, is a, is a unicellular organism uh, called a lacrimaria. There's no brain, there's no nervous system, uh, but it's, it's handling all of its local needs uh, in, in, in one cell. So you see, you know, if you're into soft robotics or things like this, the level of control and, and, and morphological computation here is, is remarkable. And all of us uh, made this journey across the Cartesian cut. We all started life as quote unquote, just physics. So a little pile of chemicals, a quiescent oocyte. And then there's this slow and remarkable process of embryonic development that produces something like this, or perhaps even something like this. And so at some point, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have folks who will say that, uh, well, we, we, we are, are certainly uh, conscious uh, and, and we have a certain level of cognition. And of course, um, the, the, an oocyte, many people will say, is not. And so then they, they owe a story of how you get from here to here, given how, how slow and continuous this process actually is. And so what I want to do uh, for, the, for the next couple of minutes is just talk about some interesting biology that isn't the standard thing that, uh, that, that we're all used to. These are examples that aren't usually covered in typical neuroscience um, AI kind of crossovers. So um, one thing that uh, should be looked at is this kind of example where you have a caterpillar. This is a soft-bodied robot. It lives in a two-dimensional world of uh, crawling on and eating leaves. And then it needs to become this, which is a, a hard-bodied robot which flies in three-dimensional space and has a completely different brain. What happens in between is that uh, the brain is basically taken apart most of the cells are, are killed off, uh, all the connections are broken, everything is, is basically liquefied, rebuilt from scratch. And the amazing thing is that uh, actually there's, there's data showing that moths and butterflies retain the memories of the original caterpillar. And so despite the fact that the medium is uh, radically, uh, re, um, uh, radically altered, the memories actually remain. So that's an interesting fact about this biological architecture that uh, we have to keep in mind if we're going to try to make something similar. And it also raises interesting questions, you know, never mind what's it like to be a butterfly, right, for people who are into consciousness, what's it like to be a caterpillar turning into a butterfly during your lifetime, not just the evolutionary time scale, but actually during your lifetime, a radical reconstruction of your cognitive medium. This is, uh, goes even further with planaria, so these are flatworms. I'll talk about them more in a few minutes, but the salient fact about planaria is that this, this system can be cut into many pieces. The record is something like, I think, uh, 275 or something like that. Um, 
and every piece will, will rebuild, regenerate, and give rise to a perfect little worm. So what McConnell discovered, and we validated using modern uh, techniques uh, recently, is that if you train a planaria, and a planaria have a centralized brain, they have the same neurotransmitters that you and I do, um, uh, if you train the planaria on a specific task, you amputate the head, the tail sits there doing nothing for about 10 days, regrows a brand new brain, at which point behavior resumes, and then you can show that it still has the original information. So not only is the information stored uh, uh, somewhere else in the body, possibly in some sort of distributed holographic uh, form, we don't know, but it can also be imprinted onto the new brain as the brain develops. So you see this, this, this tight interaction between, between morphogenesis, the shaping of, uh, of, of the cognitive organs, and the information, the, the behavioral uh, knowledge that is spread and, and moves throughout, um, throughout tissues. And this kind of plasticity is not just for invertebrates. Uh, vertebrates have it too. This is a tadpole of the frog Xenopus lavis. Here's the mouth, here are the nostrils, here's the brain, the gut. And what you'll notice is that it's missing the primary eyes. So we've, we've made this particular embryo to not have any primary eyes, but we did put some eye cells on the tail. Not only do they go on to make a perfectly nice eye, even though it's surrounded by muscle instead of uh, next to the brain where it belongs, but actually these animals can see quite well. So we've made, we've made a device that trains them on visual tasks and automates the whole process. And, uh, and we can see that even though this, this eye does not connect to the brain, it makes an optic nerve that uh, sometimes synapses on the spinal cord, sometimes goes up here to the gut, but these animals can see. So this, this does not take uh, long periods of evolutionary adaptation. In, in one generation, this animal uh, finds itself with a radically altered uh, sensory motor architecture no problem, it's getting, the brain is getting this weird, uh, these weird signals from some uh, itchy patch of tissue on its tail, and it can treat that as visual data and learn in visual um, assays. So, so, so remarkable, and we'll get to, the, we'll get to this, uh, this, this notion that what evolution is giving us here is uh, a kind of um, a problem-solving machine. It's not something that uh, just, just knows how to do one thing. It can it, it very rapidly adapt to novel uh, configurations in morphological space. And so the, the way that biology does this is that um, not only uh, structurally, but actually uh, functionally, we are all nested dolls. At, at every level of organization, from the swarm to the organ, tissue, cell, and, and molecular network level, all of these layers are uh, problem-solving uh, types of uh, processes. So, so, we, so I call this a multi-scale competency architecture with the idea that uh, some of the same uh, navigation policies are being used to solve problems in different spaces, um, metabolic spaces, transcriptional spaces, morphological spaces, and then, of course, the familiar 3D behavioral space of running mazes and, and doing things like that. So, so uh, each, each of these layers is its own uh, kind of, uh, kind of problem-solving uh, system. And this is, this is why there's another talk that I give to students sometimes called Why Robots Don't Get Cancer. And that's because uh, we, we don't have very many architectures yet where the individual parts have their own agendas and thus there's this uh, failure mode whereby uh, they can be decoupled from the, co from the collective uh, top-down agenda and sort of go off on their own and make a tumor and, and do other things. So, um, so that, that's, that's the risk of this architecture, that's the failure mode, but, but what you gain is, is incredible uh, plasticity and robustness. And so what I'm interested in as far as um, understanding how these things help us uh, to, to recognize and to build intelligences is uh, something like, like this, to develop a framework where we can abstract the notion of intelligence. And, and for this audience, I think, I think that's very easy for, for other audiences, um, this, is, this is a hard leap to make. Uh, step away from the idea that intelligence is something that large, uh, large brains do and have a more uh, kind of uh, cybernetic approach where, and I'm certainly not the first person to suggest this, you know, here's, here's uh, Rosenbluth, Wiener, and Bigelow trying for a kind of hierarchy of, of, of uh, cognitive capacities all the way from passive behavior up to human level uh, metacognition and so on. So uh, in, in our group, um, intelligence, we, we understand intelligence in the way that William James said, which is roughly the ability to reach the same goal by different means and the degree of sophistication of those means and the degree to which uh, you can handle various perturbations along the way is, is how you gauge um, the type and the, and the amount of intelligence. And as, as somebody said once, um, 
it sort of it, it describes the continuum between two magnets trying to get together and Romeo and Juliet trying to get together, right? What, what, what mechanisms exist um, on, on all the different systems on that continuum to help them do what they need to do? So, um, of course, we're, we're all very good, at, as, as many animals are, at recognizing intelligence in uh, the three-dimensional world, right? So, so medium-sized objects uh, moving at medium speeds, doing things we, we very easily recognize as having agency and, um, and, and having intelligence. But actually, there are many other spaces in which biology has been solving problems long before brains showed up. And so imagine if, if we had an innate sense of our blood chemistry or uh, if we had an innate sense of various gene expression profiles, we would have no trouble at all uh, f um, intuitively recognizing our various organs, our various cells, as navigating those spaces with very significant competency. And, and right now, we, we, you know, we're, just not, we're just not primed for that. So I'm going to... Um, spend most of my time talking about this morphospace, uh, the, the behavior of a collective intelligence of cells in this morphological space. But um, one, one idea that we've been playing with is that what basically has happened is that evolution has basically pivoted some of the same strategies across all kinds of different problem spaces, all the way from metabolic and physiological spaces up through anatomical space, classic uh, behavioral space, and then maybe linguistic, uh, behavior, linguistic space as well. And so I just want to show you a few examples of, of, of what I mean by these unconventional intelligences. So this is a slime mold. Uh, this, is, uh, this is called a Physarum polycephalum. And uh, what we've done is we've placed the slime mold here in the middle. Of the, the, by the way, the slime mold is unicellular. It's one cell. It can get very large, but it's, it's just one cell. And what we've done is we've placed one disc, one glass disc over here, three glass discs over here. And this is just one example out of a, out of a paper um, where, where we did this many, many times. And it has a, a very interesting behavior. Uh, by the way, these glass discs are completely inert. There's no food. There are no gradients. Um, uh, they're, just, they're just glass. And so, so what happens is that uh, for, the first, for the first few hours, it's sort of, the slime mold sort of grows like this. And at this point, there's no obvious indication that it's going to do anything other than continue symmetrically growing. But during this time, it turns out that what it's been doing is gathering information about its environment. The way it does that is by gently squeezing. It continuously pulses uh, the, the, uh, the medium that it's on and reads back the strain angle of the signals that it gets. And what it does after that is it grows towards the larger mass. And you can do all kinds of interesting tricks about stacking the, the, uh, the, the glass discs one on top of the other. You can, you, can, you can get the thing tilted and do various things to confuse it. But this is what it does. Here, it gathers information. And uh, boom, at that point, right, 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 right here is where you can now tell that it's decided what it's going to do. So this is, this is kind of interesting. These spaces that we talk about, are, um, they're our abstraction, right? Because behavior for this system is morphological change. So this is kind of a transitional form in which behavior and control of morphology are the same. But that's the sort of thing this single-celled uh, single organism can do. Here's another, here's another type of intelligence. Um, these, it, we, we discovered something interesting in these planaria where if you put planaria in a uh, solution of barium, barium chloride, what the barium does is uh, it's a non-specific ion channel blocker, a potassium channel blocker, uh, to, be, to be more uh, precise. And so what that means is that all the cells, especially the cells in the head, which have to exchange potassium, so all the neurons, are extremely unhappy. They literally, their heads literally explode in this barium. So overnight, it's called deep progression, just boom, their, their, their heads explode. But if you leave them in the barium, something amazing happens, and a couple of weeks later, they will grow a new head, and the new head is completely barium adapted. Doesn't care about barium at all, no problem. So we asked a simple question. We took these barium adapted heads, we took the primary original heads, and we simply uh, f asked what, what gene expressions are different? What, what, does this, what does this new head do in terms of gene expression that's different from this head? And there's only, there's only a handful of genes that are actually different, and what they allow these cells to do is to do their physiological business despite not being able to pass potassium. That, that's a pretty significant change. But there's only a handful of genes. Now, the, the kicker to all this is that uh, planarian never experience barium in the wild. That's, that it's just not ecologically um, realistic. They, they, there's never been an evolutionary history of, uh, of pressure for knowing what to do when you're hit with barium. And so I, I always think about this problem as uh, kind of like being trapped in this in this uh, nuclear reactor control room, the thing's melting down. There are, you know, the, what, 20,000 or however many genes there are, are buttons. And you're faced with this no novel stressor. How do you know which thing is going to improve your physiological situation? You certainly don't have, the cells don't turn over very fast, so you don't have time to, for, to, for random search. You don't really have time for gradient descent. 
Uh, we, we don't know. We don't know how this works. Maybe there's some sort of generalization from other types of things like epileptic excitotoxicity that, that maybe they do have. But um, it's, it's an amazing ability to walk through that transcriptional space in a way that efficiently allows you to solve for a, a completely novel um, uh, physiological stressor. So I've shown you a couple of examples of, of, of problem solving in, uh, in, these, in these unusual spaces. Uh, but what I want to um, spend the most of my time doing is talking about morphospace, uh, morphogenesis. And it's, and it's interesting, this, this idea of morphogenesis as being relevant to uh, the problem of intelligence is not new. So um, obviously, uh, the, the, the Alan Turing needs no introduction. He was interested in problem solving machines, intelligence through um, plasticity, reprogrammability, and so on. But um, you may or may not know that uh, he also wrote this. He wrote a paper on the chemical basis of morphogenesis. Now, why would somebody who is interested in intelligence and machines be interested in the chemistry of spontaneous self-organization and morphogenesis? He didn't say much about this, but I think he, I think he was onto something very deep. I think he understood, and, and I think it, this, is, this is true, that these are fundamentally the same problem. There's a, there's a very strong... Uh, kind of invariance between these two problems, and we should um, uh, we should investigate those. So so let's talk about this. So uh, we we all we all begin as this this sort of collection of blastomeres that uh, arises from from the fertilized egg, and then eventually we become something like this. So this is a cross section through a human torso. So look at this amazing order, right? Everything, all the organs, the structures, everything is in the right place next to you know the right thing and. Uh, incredibly robust. This this works correctly most of the time. So um, uh, the, the the amazing thing is that is that uh, and so and so we can we can ask okay wh where does the information come from? Where, people all, all say this all the time. Where is the information encoded for this particular layout? Well, of course you you might want to say DNA, but of course we can read genomes now. DNA doesn't say anything about this directly any more than it directly says anything about the shape of a spider web or the shape of a um, of a of a termite colony. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it provides the micro-level hardware. What the DNA gives you are the protein sequences that every single cell gets to have. Once you have those protein sequences, now comes physiology, which happens, which, which I like to think of as a, as a, as a, as a layer of software that um, is, is executed by this machine, which does some really interesting things. And uh, the key is that even though this process is very reliable, it is not hardwired. So if you take an early mammalian embryo, for example, human, and you cut it in half, you don't get two half embryos. What you get are two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. Each half recognizes the other half is missing and produces exactly what it needs. In fact, you can cut it into more pieces than that. So we have this notion <clears throat> that uh, regulative development in, in animals which can do it, which are most of them, um, is a kind of navigation of morphospace. If I boil down uh, the shape or the, the, the space of all possible anatomical configurations, which is a kind of quantitative morphospace, what we want is we want to be able to reach a particular ensemble of goal states, so the target morphology of this particular species, from different starting positions, despite various local maxima and different different uh, barriers and things like that, right? So, so we can think about morphogenesis as a navigation of this virtual space. Now, here's an example. It's not just for uh, for development. Regeneration does this too. So, here's a uh, here's a salamander uh, known as an axolotl. These guys regenerate their eyes, their jaws, uh, their tails, including spinal cord, um, their limbs, uh, uh, their ovaries. And you can see what happens in the limb if, uh, if they lose a portion of the limb, and it doesn't matter where along the axis it's lost, the cells will very rapidly grow exactly what's needed, and then they stop. This is the most amazing part, is that they stop. When do they stop? They stop when the correct salamander arm has been completed. So this means that what you really have here is a kind of uh, homeostatic, uh, 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 homeostatic uh, process whereby this, this, uh, this, this group of cells uh, is able to navigate that morphospace from different positions to the right region, recognize that they got where they're going, and then they can stop. And so here's another, here's another example. This is something that we discovered some years back where here's a tadpole. So the tadpole has the eyes, the nostrils, uh, the mouth, and so on. Uh, tadpoles need to become frogs. And in order to do that, all the pieces have to move around. They have to rearrange. And so you might think, and, and people used to think, that 
this was somehow hardwired, that every part of the face moves in a particular direction, a particular amount, and then you get from being a normal tadpole to a normal face. So we wanted to test this idea that this is some kind of hardwired process. And so what we did was we created these so-called Picasso tadpoles. So everything is, is scrambled, basically. The eyes might be on top of the head, the mouth is off to the side, everything is, everything is, is, is messed up. And largely, these type of animals result in pretty normal frogs because uh, all of these different organs will keep moving in novel paths, in fact, sometimes having to double back if they go too far, and eventually they stop when they reach the correct frog face. So what the genetics actually gives you is a kind of error minimization scheme. And we thought um, really hard about how is this possible? How is a collection of cells supposed to recognize this kind of stop condition, right? How does it, uh, how does it take measurements of what's going on now? You know, how, how, what's the, how, how does the attractor here work? What, what's going on? And we started thinking about um, how goal-seeking behavior, because fundamentally that's what this is, right? In the cybernetic sense, this is a goal-seeking system. There's a particular set of states that will expend energy to attain, even if you try to deviate it and to push it off of that state. So how, how does this work? Well, um, kind of the obvious um, uh, example is what happens in the brain. And so, and so in the brain, we know what the hardware looks like. We know uh, some of the behaviors of the, of the software layer. And there's this, pr uh, there's this um, idea, which several people have talked about today, of neural decoding, the idea that uh, if we understood how to decode the electrical activity, so this is a zebrafish movie, um, a, ze a movie of a zebrafish brain um, in the living state uh, as it's uh, doing whatever, whatever uh, computations that it's doing. If we understood how to decode this, the commitment of neuroscience is that that's where the cognition is. We would know the memories, the preferences, the behavioral repertoire. We could, we could somehow, somehow decode that. Um, but the interesting thing is that this, this, kind of, this kind of architecture is extremely ancient. And long before brains and neurons appeared, you had exactly the same thing in the rest of the body. Whereas, here, let's go back to, uh, to this for a second. Whereas the way this works is that the electric circuits make various decisions that are then uh, used to control muscles to move your body in three-dimensional space. Uh, where this comes from is a much more uh, ancient system where these same electrical circuits uh, control various cell behaviors, not just muscles, but all cell behaviors, cell movement, cell division, cell differentiation, uh, shape change, and so on, to move the configuration of the body in morphous space. I think that what evolution did in, uh, in creating... Um, uh, creating nervous systems is that it repurposed the system uh, and, and, and of course sped optimized it because, because the original system works at the scale of hours, not milliseconds, and also made some trade-offs of space for time in terms of what, um, what, it, uh, what it measures. But the, uh, what you can do then is you can think of the exact same kind of research program uh, that comes from neuroscience and say, okay, could we use actually this, all the same techniques to track the uh, the, the physiological activity of this process and try to decode it. What, I, what are the electrical networks of the body thinking about? What memories do they have? What behavioral repertoires do they have? And so the fact is that every cell in your body has ion channels. Most cells have electrical synapses to their neighbors that selectively propagate electrical states. And, uh, and, and so you can, you can see here this whole, this whole story of how we got to neurons from other cell types. But uh, the interesting thing is that... Um, uh, m most of the techniques of neuroscience, in fact, do not distinguish. I mean, everything works. We've, we've, we've carried over many things uh, from neuroscience into other contexts. And so uh, the kinds of things that serve as neural inspirations for AI and for, for intelligence, for um, consciousness, a few people talked about consciousness, the mechanisms of all this are, in fact, ubiquitous in the body. They're everywhere. There are, there are very few um, of, of uh, the kinds of things that certain theories of consciousness, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, talk about in the brain, most of these underlying processes are actually ubiquitous. And so, so that, that may have implications for, for, for uh, where we think uh, consciousness could be, um, could be found. So I want to show you just one, one example. Uh, this is a, uh, a time-lapse video of an early frog embryo putting its face together. Um, so here, this is, a, this is uh, the, the way we do the imaging is with a voltage-sensitive fluorescent dye, very similar to how you might uh, look at electrical activity in the brain. Uh, and one frame out of that video looks like this. This is a snapshot of an early 
uh, of an early pre-pattern that tells these cells where all the organs of the face are going to go. Um, here's where the first eye is going to go, here's where the mouth is going to go, the placodes. Uh, this, is, this is a glimpse of a decode, and the reason I'm showing you this is because this is one of the easiest to decode. In fact, it almost looks like a face. We call this the electric face. Um, this is a snapshot of what the tissue is thinking as it prepares to turn on the various gene expression domains that are actually going to build these various organs. And we know it's functional, uh, we, it's instructive, because if you move any of this, if you change these states, the anatomy follows. And I'll show you a few examples of that. So, so, so tracking this is all well and good, but we want to make um, uh, changes. We want to, make fun we want to be able to do functional experiments. And for that, we don't use electric fields. We don't use electrodes, really. We don't, uh, but no, no magnetics, no EM waves. We basically uh, appropriate all the tools of neuroscience. So for these uh, electrical um, synapses, these gap junctions, we can uh, change the topology or the connectivity of the network by opening and closing these things or introducing new ones for the actual, and this, this is similar to uh, controlling the synaptic plasticity. This is uh, the intrinsic plasticity where we can go in and directly change the voltage of individual cells either pharmacologically by opening and closing channels or quite specifically with optogenetics. So we can use light to, uh, to trigger uh, specific voltage changes. Um, and of course, we can, do, we can do this at the neurotransmitter level as well. And so we have the ability to basically to do what people like Tanagawa do when they uh, try to incept false memories into the brains of mice. We can incept false pattern memories into non-neural tissues. And so all of the tool, the, the, these kind of benchtop techniques, including the, the um, kind of the conceptual stuff, you know, perceptual control theory, active influence, uh, all these kinds of things, we, we use them routinely to address the things going on in, the, in navigating morphous space. So here's an example. I showed you that electric face. We showed you there's a, there's a particular pattern uh, that, that, that controls where the eye goes. So we simply said, okay, could we uh, artificially establish that same bioelectric pattern somewhere else in the body, what, what would happen? And so here's what happens. The way we do it was in, the, in this particular case, we injected RNA encoding uh, an ion channel, a potassium channel that uh, established a little, a little spatial domain. And the, and the code, by the way, is, is, is multicellular. It's not, single, it's not a single cell code. So we established a multicellular domain of the right voltage. And sure enough, these cells build a complete eye. They can make this eye anywhere, in the gut, on the tail, anywhere. Now, notice a few interesting things about this. First of all, it's extremely modular. What we are not doing here is telling individual stem cells what to be. We are not providing enough information to actually build an eye. We have no idea how to build an eye. It, eyes have all of these complex uh, structures inside. What we're doing is providing a very high level subroutine call. It's a trigger that says, build an eye here. Downstream of that are all the gene expressions, the cell movements, everything else that is the implementation machinery. But the trigger, that, um, that goal-directed behavior, that, that, that movement in morphous space that causes these, these cells to move from, from what um, their, uh, their old uh, kind of uh, morphology was to, a, to an eye shape, all of that is triggered by a fairly simple bioelectrical state. It's, a, it's almost a stimulus that causes a, you know, a trigger that causes a complex behavior. Now, the other amazing thing is this. Um, this, this right here is a cross-section through an ectopic lens uh, like this that's sitting out in the tail of a, of a tadpole somewhere that we induced. The blue cells here are the ones that uh, bear the uh, ectopic ion channel, this potassium channel, and they're blue because of beta-galactosidase label. So we can tell which cells we actually injected. All the rest of these cells that are participating in making this nice lens are not labeled. Now what happened here is that when we injected this, we didn't get enough cells to make a proper lens. And so the first instructive interaction was when we told these cells, you should make an eye with our, with our voltage signal. But then what they had the competency to do is to recruit their neighbors. They, uh, the, the system can tell that there's not enough of these guys to make an eye. And so they recruit as many of their neighbors as needed to actually make this, make this uh, complete organ. We didn't do any of that. That's, that's built in. That's a built-in competency to the system. The plasticity of this, of the system is ready to receive large organ level uh, information to rearrange that large scale structure and have new behaviors. And by the way, trigger downstream uh, cascades such as uh, recruiting other, other, uh, other cell types. And, and this, of course, is found in other types of collective intelligences. So, so ants uh, and, and termites will um, uh, you know, recruit their, their buddies when, when there's a task to be done that uh, that's, uh, you know, kind of requires more of them. So there's, this, there's this, the, these amazing, uh, interesting uh, competencies 
Now I want to show you. Uh, I want to want to show you uh, another way to uh, to interact with these pattern memories. So so here 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 are our planaria. So one head, one tail. This is a normal normal worm. If you look at where the gene expression is, well, the anterior marker, of course, is at the head, telling you one head, uh, one tail. And um, what what this what this guy will do if we if we chop off the head and the tail, that middle fragment will give you a nice one-headed worm. 100% of the time, they're extremely uh, robust with this. But what we notice now, now you, you might ask, so, so there's this fragment, how does it know how many heads it's supposed to have, right? And how does it know, uh, you know, the, the, these cells up here will make a tail, these cells here will make a head, but they're right next to each other when you cut them apart. How do they know what they're supposed to make? So we looked and we found this, this voltage gradient that basically this is a map of this, of this animal telling us, oh yeah, one head, one tail, and that in fact is what they build. So, so what we did was we worked out a pharmacological way and by the way, uh, some of these things uh, are exactly uh, mirroring, so, 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 um, so uh, general anesthetics, right? If you want a bunch of cells to forget what they're supposed to be doing, general anesthetic is a really good way to do that. Um, so there's some nice, uh, there's some nice um, analogies to, 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 to the coherence of, of minds and so on. So, so what you can do is you can uh, produce a different pattern that says two heads. And this is, this is quite messy, the technology is still, is still quite young, but you can produce this pattern and if you do that in this animal, when you cut him, he will produce a two-headed animal. This is not Photoshop. These are real, well, real live worms, even though the genetics are untouched. The hardware is exactly the same. There's nothing wrong with the, with the genetics here. We didn't edit the genome. And, and the other critical thing is that this map is not a map of this two-headed body. This is a map of this one-headed animal. So it's basically, you can think about this as a primitive form of counterfactual memory. The, a kind of very simple form in morphous space of what we like about brains, which is this ability to time travel, to, to, to have memories and, predict, and make predictions about things that are not true right now. So even though anatomically this animal has one head and one tail, if you were to look to see what is, what is your idea of what the correct planarian uh, looks like, that's very clear, it's two heads. So if you get injured, that's what you'll do. If you don't get injured, nothing happens. It's a latent memory that doesn't get activated. So when I talk about, uh, the collective of cells being a real a collective intelligence, this is what I mean. The, the, it, we can literally read the memories that it has, at least in, in some cases, such as this. And we know now, very much like in the brain, that the same hardware, the same hardware is capable of having one of two different ideas of what a correct planarian looks like. It's, it's a representation of a future morphological state, the goal of its uh, movement through morphous space if it's called upon to move through morphous space. Now, I keep calling it a memory because uh, if you cut these animals, uh, so, so here's our two-headed worm, you cut off the primary head, you cut off this crazy ectopic secondary head, you take this middle fragment and you might think, well, the genetics are untouched. In plain water, it should just go back to normal and make one head, one tail. And that's not what it does. The circuit, the electrical circuit that keeps this information uh, has, has memory. Um, in fact, it has all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable. It's rewritable by experience, not by, not by hardware manipulation, but by experience. Uh, it has latency, which I just showed you, or conditional recall, and it has two possible behaviors. So what happens is, as far as we can tell, in perpetuity, once you make these two-headed animals, they stay two-headed, even though their genome is wild-type, and, and we now know how to make them go back. We can actually reset the circuit, so it's kind of like a almost a flip-flop where we can kind of go back and forth between that circuit encoding one state, one head or two head kinds of states. And here you can see this is a video. You can see these, uh, these two headed animals uh, um, hanging out. So um, not only can you, can you take this, uh, this kind of a machine and tell it how many heads it's supposed to have, you can actually tell it what kind of head to have. So here's, uh, here's a planarian with normally a triangular uh, head shape like this. <clears throat> what we can do is amputate the head and then treat the rest of the tissue in a way that uh, basically using a general anesthetic that just all it does, so, so general anesthetics, among other things, uncouple gap junctions, so they uncouple these electrical synapses, and when you uncouple them, what happens is the individual cells are still alive, but things like uh, global, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of global computations go away, and then when you pull them out of the, the, the um, when you put them out of the compound, they settle down, but they don't always settle into the same state. Actually, this is true in, in for example, humans as well. There are, there are, the, the reason that they don't like um, giving general anesthesia to people is that some people have psychotic breaks because the brain does not come back to the same state. It's actually, to me, kind of miraculous that it ever comes back to the same state if you sort of uncouple all the activity. But what you can do here with these guys is 
uh, when, when, when they come back, they sometimes come back flat-headed, like this P. felina. Sometimes they come back round-headed, like this S. mediterranea. And uh, the, the, uh, the evolutionary distance here is between, between these guys and the actual um, species. It's about 150 million years. So without genetic change, you can explore different attractors in morphospace space that other species live in naturally. Yeah? And, and maybe this, this, this may be how the speciation happened. We, 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 we don't know. And it's not just the shape of the head. It's also um, the shape of the brain and the distribution of stem cells are exactly the same as these other species. So you get, you get the idea of this, this incredible uh, reprogrammability and plasticity that goes beyond the default uh, kinds of robust behaviors that, um, that, the, that the standard... Uh, machine is, does after uh, after development, and um, not only that, but you can explore regions of, of the latent space uh, that are very far from normal planaria. So here's your normal planaria. We can make these crazy spiky forms. We can make something that's cylindrical, has a different um, uh, kind of a symmetry body plan symmetry. You can make these uh, these kind of uh, hybrid forms, and the thing is that uh, a lot of biological uh, kinds of um, uh, hardware is extremely reprogrammable. So this is these these kinds of things. If you've ever seen them in the wild, these are called galls. And there's a there's a wasp embryo that's that's in there. But these are not made of the wasp cells. These are made of the leaf cells of the plant. So normally the, le the these cells, what they normally do is they make this nice flat leaf. And people who who are uh, focused on, on on genetics and molecular biology will say, well, that's what the genome encodes is is the ability to make these flat leaves. But in fact, it's very easily hacked by, uh, by this parasite that gives them signals uh, to form something completely different, right? So the morphology, so these leaf cells are in fact able to form something like this, it's just that they normally don't. So um, uh, I want to uh, now uh, start, to, start to pull back and uh, try to really, really talk about uh, what we mean by uh, a collective intelligence in uh, whatever space it's acting in. So th this is what happens during evolution is that the components like this, which are very competent at very local, tiny little goals, so metabolic goals, um, thing, things that little, the things that individual cells do, d using bioelectricity and other uh, types of modalities, including chemical signaling, of course, biomechanical signaling, they scale up to systems that have much bigger goals. So this system has, uh, has the ability to try to reach this goal, something like organogenesis, despite all kinds of perturbations that I've shown you and so on. And so there's, there's this scale up of, uh, there's, a, there's a flip in space, so, so this now is in morphous space, and there's a scale up of the kinds of goals that it can achieve. But that process, of course, has failure modes, and that failure mode is cancer. So this is, this is human uh, glioblastoma in a dish. Uh, what happens is that um, individual cells, when they electrically disconnect from their neighbors, and that can be caused by a variety of factors, at that point, they basically just revert back to their unicellular past. They are no longer uh, interested or capable of, of understanding um, uh, what the, the, the behavioral uh, cues that uh, bind all of them towards these kind of larger scale construction projects, and they go back on their own. At that point, the rest of the animal is just amoeba. It's just an environment to these, to these amoebas, and that's metastasis. And so um, there's a there's a the the, the utility of, of these kinds of uh, this kind of thinking where you think about um, these these cancer cells are not more selfish. It's just that their cells are smaller. The computational boundary has shrunk to the level of a single cell, and that leads you naturally to some new therapeutics. So, for example, here you can see when you induce an, a human oncogene into these tadpoles, and they're going to make a tumor. Even before the tumor forms, you can already see these, these bioelectrical disconnections of these cells from the network. You know exactly where the tumor is going to be. And if you co-inject an ion channel that forces the cells uh, to remain in electrical communication, it doesn't kill the cells, doesn't fix the, the genetic uh, mutation. And you can see that here. The oncogene is blazingly expressed. This is an, it can be a nasty uh, KRAS mutation or a P53 or whatever. Uh, in fact, it's all over the place. There's no tumor because what drives the whole collective outcome is uh, is is the uh, the behavior of the of the network? The the individual cells are are, are actually much less important here, and so you can try to re, re expand that sort of cognitive uh, boundary uh, to uh, to to try to get the cells uh, connected with each other and to, to pursue organogenesis and so on. So this this issue of these these cognitive boundaries between right the 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 boundary between self and outside world in a standard human. You would think it's very simple, right? It's it's well, the, well there's our human. There's there's where the body ends. Although uh, you know this this idea of um, the extended um, the extended mind, right? Um, 
Andy Clark's and, and, and those kind of ideas are, are already stretching that. But, but it's, really, it's really more fundamental. Um, if, if, if you didn't already know what a human was and somebody, uh, somebody showed you a, a brain, you know, this, this, you know, this uh, uh, three and a half or whatever uh, pound mass, um, how many individual selves would you say are in there? You, you really don't know because we don't have a way of saying, you know, per, per pound, this is, how many, this, this is how much real estate it takes to make a self. And the same thing is true of embryogenesis. When you, so this, is, this is a deep problem of, of uh, an, individual, uh, uh, an individual emergent system arising from a sea of uh, components. This is, this is an embryonic blastoderm, right? It's, it's, it's an early, let's say 50,000 cells. And you look at it and you say, well, that's an embryo. And when you look at it, given that there's 50,000 cells, you can ask yourself, um, well, first of all, what are we counting? Uh, what, what is an embryo as, as distinct from the, the individual cells we're looking at? And can we guess how many embryos are present in any particular blastoderm? And usually the answer is one. And so you might, and just like usually, there's, there's seemingly one individual in a, in a, in a brain. Um, but it doesn't have to be one. And what can happen is this. And I used to do these experiments myself as a grad student. You can take an, uh, an avian or, or a mammalian blastoderm, and you take a little needle, and you make, a little, uh, you make some scratches in it. And what happens is when you make these scratches, each domain that can't temporarily, because the scratches will heal, will temporarily uh, will self-organize into a new embryo. And when the scratches do heal, you end up with conjoint twins. And so you will have these regions, each of them as a separate embryo, uh, then there's some disputed zones, which is kind of interesting, these cells that don't quite know who they belong to. But uh, a particular blastoderm can give rise to zero, one, or several individuals. Now, in the, in the case of morphogenesis, what are individuals? Well, they are collections of cells that are bound to a common purpose. They're going to make a specific thing, meaning they're going to move to the right region of morphospace. They're going to have two eyes and then you know, four limbs and then various other things. Um, and, and that's what we're counting. We're ca counting independent goal-following systems. And in, in this sort of uh, um, uh, excitable medium, there can be multiple, depending on the dynamics, multiple numbers of them. It's not genetically determined. I mean, usually it's one, but it doesn't have to be one. And this is, this is true in brains as well, where we see split brain patients and various dissociative disorders. There's no guarantee that in that medium there's one individual. And so um, what, what we're interested in is, is kind of merging uh, these ideas of uh, understanding the, the bioelectric circuitry and the, and the, and the um, attractors and the other, the other uh, kind of features of that, of that uh, state space and merging them with, with ideas about uh, how memories are stored in electrical networks, uh, what it means when we can recover portion of that information after damage, and, and of course the dynamical systems approaches to this and so on. And so what we really need, and this is, this is very active uh, kind of work in our lab now, is to understand the scaling where we start with individual tiny little competent subunits which can do homeostatic things like uh, keep pH and hunger level and so on. So, so individual cells, and then you bind them together into networks that have particular policies for spreading signals back and forth, and we can talk about what some of those important policies are. And as a result of this, what you get is a, uh, um, an increase in what we call the cognitive light cone, the, the size of the, the, the maximal spatiotemporal size of the biggest goal that it can hang on to or they can, that it can pursue. So individual cells pursue little tiny goals, collections of cells pursue bigger goals, and so on. Now, now when we talk about these, these kind of the size of these goals, typically if we ask, well, where do they come from? And, and this, the standard answer is, well, evolutionary selection, of course. You get them, you get them from evolution. Um, but what about novelty? And we have examples like this, uh, and uh, I can show you much more on this, but, but I don't have too much time left. Uh, these are um, what we call xenobots. Xenopus labus is the name of the frog, and we can use frog skin cells to make something to make a biological robot or a biobot called a xenobot. These little these little things running around are just skin. They're just frog skin that was liberated from the rest of the animal, rebooted into a new kind of cr uh, critter with a new behavior. This is a very interesting. They have many new behaviors, but here's one: if you provide them with a bunch of loose cells, what they will do is they will run around and collect these cells into little balls and sort of polish them like this. And because the little balls are not passive, they're, um, they're, agential, they're an agential material, just like the, the original, they will mature into the next generation of xenobots and continue to do the same thing. So this is a, cell, a kinematic self-replicating system. This is kind of von Neumann's dream, you know, a robot that goes around and finds um, materials in the environment and builds copies of itself. But 
the, the, the interesting thing here is that there's never been evolutionary selection to do this. No other animal does kinematic self-replication. When you look at these skin cells in vivo, you might think, well, the only thing they could possibly know how to do is to be this boring two-dimensional layer that keeps the bacteria out, you know, on the, on the, on the outer side of, uh, uh, of, of these embryos. But in fact, liberated from those instructive cues, you get to find out that actually they can do all kinds of things by themselves. And they have, uh, within about 48 hours, they, uh, they, they exhibit reproductive behavior that's completely different to how frogs normally reproduce because we've made it impossible for them to reproduce their normal way. This is just skin. It can't do any of that other stuff. So, so this, the, the ability of all the parts to have co uh, coherent uh, novel behaviors and to solve new problems that were not actually anywhere in the training set is, is really interesting here. And um, for that reason, uh, this incredibly large option space, you know, all of, all of the natural model systems of, of biology are here, including brains that, that we like to get inspiration from, but all this other stuff, so hybrids and cyborgs and hybrids of various kinds, you know, every combination of, of cellular material, uh, designed, uh, engineered material and software is some kind of viable agent. So there's, a, there's this huge kind of uh, option space of, of, of novel um, intelligences that I think we really need to mine uh, as in, in addition to whatever uh, insights we can get from, from standard brains. And so um, in the end, I'm just going to cl close here with a couple of thoughts. Uh, this idea that um, non-neural bioelectricity is a kind of cognitive glue for, for, for collective intelligence in morphogenetic space, exactly as it serves as the co cognitive glue to neurons in the brain and be in traditional behavioral space. Um, I, I think it has some, some interesting things uh, to say to neuroscience in terms of the origins of the amazing things that neuroscientists study and vice versa. And we, you know, we certainly benefit from, from, all of the, uh, from all the insights of the field. And the same thing with, with AI, you know, I think that uh, there are some just this idea of diverse intelligence in unconventional embodiments is a really powerful set of inspirations for um, creating creating novel robotics, no, novel AI systems that are not specifically not neuromorphic, that are looking at more basic fundamental principles, and all of this kind of stuff. So, so you know, we 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 kind of appropriate a lot of ideas. I could show you data on on perceptual bistability in morphospace space planaria that can't decide if they want one head or two, and so they sort of shift back and forth, and so on. Um, the ma many many uh, deep areas of uh, intersection here among these three fields, and so. From all this, this, this uh, kind of these ideas about um, uh, these ideas about uh, uh, how individual pieces come to to be a single coherent thing, give us some suggestions for uh, what might you want from a from a real agent. You know, this idea that when, when we make these things, everything has to be determined on the fly. We can't predefine. Uh, uh, what you know, a built-in model of what they are, where their boundaries are. They have to emerge spontaneously through autopoiesis. They have to figure out where the world starts, where do they end, what do they have, what effectors. As you saw from from all of these uh, examples, you know the the uh, tadpoles with the eyes on their tails and everything. They make biological systems make very few assumptions really about what happened before. The whole the the product of the evolutionary process is a problem-solving machine that starts from scratch. Uh, kind of, I call it play the hand you're dealt. You know, they, they sort of, they do not make uh, too many assumptions about how the world is. I can show you many examples of uh, beings that have too many cells, too few cells, uh, did the wrong kinds of cells, and they will always try to figure out something useful to do with that. So that process, I think that process of self-construction is really going to be critical for, for a proper intelligence. So um, anybody who's interested can kind of dive into some of the details here. Um, so I just want to uh, thank all of the, uh, the students and the postdocs who have done the work, um, thank our funders, um, I'll do a disclosure here, Fauna Systems, because Josh Bongard and I have a, uh, a startup company around uh, computer designed uh, biorobotics. And um, yeah, and, and just to, just to, you know, the, my, my final message is that I think that this multi-scale competency architecture, which is made up of these agential materials that basically behavior shape each other, uh, to accomplish uh, sp specific uh, outcomes in, in, in morphospace space uh, can really teach us a lot about how collective intelligence works and how we can um, engineer it. So I'll stop here and thank you all for listening. several times through the, <laughs> through the talk and through the panel. Uh, so one question regarding the uh, 
the, the worm and the head. And he said that the, it, the memory is the TV that so it uh, builds the same head with the same functionality and same memory. So if the memory is in the body, why does it in the head? So what's the functionality of the head? So is it like the executive? Is the uh, memory not all places that get replicated? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also uh, your uh, idea about selfhood and uh, limits of self, I think that was very... Uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so the thing with planaria is that the brain is actually required for behavior. So when you cut off the head, the, the remaining body parts really don't do anything. They just sit there. Uh, they, they don't, so, so you wouldn't know whether it had memory or it didn't have memory because it doesn't do anything. And so in order to, uh, to, to uh, observe evidence of, of, the, of the memory, you have to let it regrow the head so that it can actually start to behave. So I think that... Um, the rest of the body, and we don't know exactly where the memory is. We don't know if it's in the neurons. We don't know if it's in every, you know, if it's in all the tissues. We really don't know. Uh, but I think that the memory outside of the brain is kind of like um, passive. It, it, it doesn't, it, it's stored, all right, but it doesn't have the ability to act or to be read out. I think, I, I personally think that, uh, and of course, this is a, a, extremely controversial, but, but I'm not the only person uh, thinking about it this way. This idea that to what extent are, are specific memories actually stored in the neurons versus the neurons being a, um, a kind of decoding machinery from, from other cellular substrates. And there's, there's, there's some nice work on that. So, so I, think, I think there's something to that. And, uh, but, but you definitely need the brain to be able to read out the memories and act in the, re in the three-dimensional world. Thank you. This view of, of localization in a sense that comes out, out of your views. But I want to push that a moment. So we will often be in that situation where there's something that could happen that is good for me. Like if, if I think about myself as being small, and what I'm going to do is I, I, I want someone over there, which isn't my direct neighbor, to do something for me. And at some level, what we want is something that's almost like gradient descent then, or like where I tell my neighbor, hey, can you move out of the way? Mm -hmm. And they tell mm -hmm. their neighbor, hey, can you mm -hmm. move out of the way? Mm -hmm. And so this chaining that we have in gradient descent in AI should be the case for biology yep. at all levels, yep. if I like hear you loudly yep. again. Yep. Yep. So, so I, I, I wonder if you took so far basically just say that gradient descent should be a ubiquitous property in biology. So so this is this is really interesting. And uh, um. I, I have a slide, I didn't bring it here just for lack of time, but I have a slide that shows almost exactly what you just said. So, so think about, think about um, the role of stress, right? So imagine, imagine I'm gonna to try to describe this, this, this slide in, the, in words here. Imagine that you have a bunch of cells and there's one cell at the bottom that's not at the right location. It wants to get up here to the top. Now the problem is that all of these other cells are perfectly happy where they are. They're not getting out of the way for this. And so this cell is very stressed because, because it's not in the right location. What you can do is you can export your stress. You can start to leak your stress to the neighbors. The neighbors also start to feel stressed. They don't know that it's not their stress because all the, the stress molecules are exactly identical. And so the temperature of the whole system rises. They, so they start to get a little plastic and everybody's kind of willing to move around a little bit. And then you end up, you know, then, then you can get to where you can go. And then the global, you, you reach some kind of global maximum and everybody's happy. And it's a way to, um, it's a way to, to, to have this kind of cooperativity without really any altruism because all the other cells want to do is minimize their own stress and, and you're stressing them out and the way for them to have lower stress is to have you have lower stress and so it's it's like this collective again it's i think it's one of these things that helps the collectivism so if if you want to call that gradient descent i'd love to talk more because uh I, you know i'm not i'm not an expert in gradient descent so i'm not sure but if that's what it is i i'd love to know about it i think it's quite similar i'd love to okay that, up. that would be great that would be great yeah Thank you. And that was also a perfect question uh, for me to follow up on. Um, so I come from a multi-agent RL background, multi-agent systems, and something that um, I guess the goal of multi-agent systems is to is to model the collection of agents working together uh, to solve tasks, something like that. So like a, a larger collection of intelligence. In multi-agent RL, the way we do this is agents share reward, and so. Um, this could be sharing stress, this could be uh, sharing food or, or whatever, right? Mm, mm, uh, mm. So this models the group of agents as a, as a larger self, if mm, you will. Mm, mm. Um, although, like, there's also work, like, recent work in the last few years are, like, 
if the group of the agents grows too big, uh, then performance might degrade, or uh, if these agents fully share their rewards, performance might degrade. Yeah. So is there anything like this where um, between cells they might not fully share their stress or fully share their rewards, but um, there's kind of like a, a degree there where where maybe I don't want to offload all of my reward, but just part, part of my reward yeah. to kind of help cooperation. Yeah, courage. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, Sarah Marzen, who who is uh, an RL expert, I'm I'm not. Um, we're, we're we're writing a paper on on this on this topic. There are there are two. I can think of two examples that are similar to what to what you're saying. One is uh, Chris Chris Fields and I had this this idea a while back for for one of the re, one of the um, uh, drivers of multicellularity might be that if if you you as a as a simple cell want to be able to do some kind of active inference and predict your environment the most predictable thing out there in a very uncertain environment would be a copy of yourself. So the nice thing to do would be to surround yourself with copies of yourself so that you have some prayer of, of you know, having a stable environment and knowing what's coming next, at which point what you might want to do is addict your neighbors to hang out with you. So you might have these kind of autocrine and paracrine loops where you're secreting some sort of goodies, maybe opioid, you know, natural opioids, maybe, maybe nutrients, who knows. But but you're, you you know you might you might try to share some of this to to keep the other cells around and and kind of um, maintain this. The other the other aspect of of what you just said is seen in gap junctions. The, the the magical thing about gap junctions, which are these connections that allow molecules to pass directly from the inside of one cell to the other, is this. Under traditional uh, signaling modes, one cell will secrete some kind of chemical. It sort of floats over. The other cell has receptors and it feels it. The thing with that is that the other, the receiving cell is very clear that this is a signal that came from outside, and then you might ignore it, you might learn from it, what, you know, whatever. But it came from outside. Gap junctions are different because if something happens, so so cell A and B are connected with gap junctions. Something happens to cell A, it triggers some sort of um, a, a memory trace, let's say a calcium spike or something like that. That immediately propagates into cell B. What these gap junctions do is they kind of erase the ownership on that data. There's no metadata on the calcium about where it came from. Calcium is calcium. And so whatever else comes across as a signal of that information or a reward or whatever it is, is shared equally by the two cells or, or not equally because the gap junctions can be regulated, right? So they, they're tunable. And so what, hap what that tends to do is, um, I, th I think what goes on here is that it erases the individual identities because... If, if, you're, if A and B cannot cleanly maintain their individual memories, if they share memories, it's kind of like this, this, this mind meld because now it's not that I have my own memories and you have your own memories. Now there's just we because it's the same pool of molecules, right? And it also makes it impossible to defect in a game theory sense because, because if you're connected and I do something nasty to you, well, guess what? It comes back to me immediately. So, so it forces this cooperativity. It forces a kind of um, sharing of... of uh, you know, of, 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 of our past that, that binds us together. And I think in that sense, uh, no, no, you know, I, to my knowledge, nobody's actually studied this in, in, in detail, but I bet exactly what you're saying, that, that if we were able to track the reward molecules going through these things, we would find some dynamics that are um, kind of uh, understandable under these various frameworks like RL and other things that you guys study. Cool, thanks. Thanks. a bit on your notion of ubiquitous intelligence, mm. right? So, so from what I see, I really like the idea that it goes through kind of atomic networks, the cell-to-cell -cell interaction networks, but it sounds to me like you, you ascribe every complex system that, that that's interconnected and that this interaction between these individual agents, that if there's an adaptive behavior, that it's somehow intelligent. Right, let, let's, but my question basically is, like, where is the boundary? Let, let's assume a block of metal is not intelligent because it's, it's, it's not an uh, interactive complex system. Uh, sure. It's observed uh, in laws of physics. And, and, but uh, in your framework, I mean, the weather might be, right? Because you have interacting things and you have interactions and it's a complex system. And, and I, I just wonder, um, so in your framework, do you think that from cell to cell interaction, gene to gene interaction, to neuron to neuron interaction, is it just a slow, continuous scale up? Uh, uh, basically, it's just a time scale that's different uh, because we have like these learning rules in the brain which we'd like to understand. Do you think the same thing holds true for the cells? It's just that it's a different 
time scale in which events would get there. And I think, uh, like let's say IBM uh, organizes workers to, to get a, to, to develop a brain model that I don't know is able to solve some problems with intelligence, right? So so uh, in a sense, like ChatGPT can solve problems, or AI has uh, improved uh, or become more intelligent because it is able actually to solve certain problems. So my question is, in your framework, then you would say if, if we just wire up a bunch of neurons uh, artificially. Uh, they are doing something and create some kind of dynamics. Uh, that's not the intelligence we're interested in, right? So, so do you think that the qualities is different in how the brain is, is doing the, the intelligence and how cells develop as an intelligence? Okay, great. Yeah, great, great question. So, so here's, here's what I would say. For, first of all, um, I, I do not believe in intelligence as a binary notion. So I don't think we can say, yes, it is, no, it isn't. I think the real question is how much and what kind. So I think there's a continuum. And we can talk in a minute about whether there's really, there are these uh, kind of great transitions or it's really a smooth continuum. And the other thing is that I absolutely agree with you in that intelligence cannot be, be, uh, be attributed simply on the basis of complexity or dynamical, you know, some kind of dynamical system. The whole point of some degree of intelligence, and, and this is, uh, so, so I don't know if you can see the slide I put up, but, but this, is, this is what um, Wiener and et al. Were, were trying for, is they were giving uh, f functional criteria for assigning certain kinds of intelligence, which, by the way, you can only ass assess in experiment. So if you bring me some kind of extremely complex system, you have to, and, and, and we want to make intelligence claims about it, we have to, on, on my framework, we have to do a couple of things. We have to, first of all, uh, uh, pick a problem space, okay? Then we have to pick uh, some kind of, um, uh, 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 some kind of uh, goal or problem solving behavior that we think it's doing. And then we have to do experiments to see how much uh, what, what kinds of uh, 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 competencies, uh, some of them are on this chart here, it can muster to, and, and, then, and then we have an empirical a answer to, you know, if, if two people have a model, one person says, nah, I think it's just, um, you know, it, it's just a hardwired thing that does the same thing. Somebody else says, well, I think it's a Breitenberg vehicle of type two. Somebody else says, no, I think it has metacognition and it knows what it knows. These are all empirical uh, questions. We have to do the experiment. I'll give you a very simple example. If you look at a gene regulatory network, right? So these are just, it's a, it's a mathematical model that literally just says it has, you know, maybe let's say a dozen genes and each one turns another one on and off. So it's a set of coupled ordinary differential equations, for example. So you look at this thing and you say, okay, this, this, the, the traditional view was that, look, th this is clearly, it's an, it's a, it's a complex dynamical system, but there's no magic here. It's, we can see where all the part, you know, what, what it's doing. It's this, this, there's no way this thing's intelligent. And what we said, what we said was, let's do the experiment. And what we found out was that it can actually, it can actually do six different kinds of learning, including associative conditioning. So is it, is it highly intelligent? No. Can it do associative learning? And is associative learning a kind of intelligence somewhere on the spectrum of the kinds of things we mean? I, I would say so. But we didn't know that until we did the experiment. We tried to train it, and we observed what it can do. So when you brought up the weather, I think that's actually really interesting. And I've, I've made this, this exact claim about the weather. At the moment, we have no idea. Why? Because nobody's tried training the weather. It is, I, I do not think we know right, whether or not if you tried uh, certain kinds of behavioral uh, kinds of paradigms, things that come from behavioral science, we, we would then find out, no, actually the weather doesn't have any kind of learning capacity, so it's, it's zero or extremely low. Or we would find that, oh, whoa, it actually, uh, much like this genetic network that people, these, these gen biological gen uh, transcriptional networks that people thought had, had none of this, in fact, have some. So I, I, you know, I kind of, ju I just insist on two things. One is that uh, we, that this is a matter for experiment, not for armchair kind of, um, you know, I, I don't think we can have feelings about systems as to whether they should be intelligent or not. We have to do experiments, which means you make a claim about what type of like, like this is one, I, I have a different actually, um, a different scale that I came up with, but this is, this is Wiener's is, is fine too. Uh, you, you pick where you think it is on this and then you see whether your model gives you better prediction and control versus somebody else who picks a different spot on the spectrum. So, you know, as long as we stick to, 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 to empirical uh, experiments, then we can find out what kind of intelligence anything has. Thanks. Thank you.